The following program is underwritten in part by World's Best Cat Litter. You love your cat, but you don't love the litter box mess. Switch to World's Best Cat Litter and get a cleaner litter box with less hassle and less litter. Find it at Target, Walmart, and in your local grocery and pet stores. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. You ready to do this again? I'm ready. I'm always ready. Today is our 16th anniversary of wow. Animal Radio. We've been doing this for 16, 16 years. Hard to believe. We can drive a car now? <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to find out about the dogs that protect the president. Of course, uh, Donald Trump inaugurated yesterday. And uh, even though he doesn't have his own dog, there are dogs that watch out for him as part of the Secret Service. I did not know this. I didn't either. Did you know this, Lori? No. Um, mm Okay, so we're going to find out all about the Secret Service dogs and, and maybe find out how many there are. I'm kind of curious. Yeah. That's I all the way. I used to live in, in Washington, D.C. I know. I've never been doing news for how long? Never saw a picture of it? You've never Amazing. seen a oh. Secret Service dog. You never hear never. about them. Well, They're probably wearing camo. That's why you don't notice them. Sunglasses. Uh, yeah, maybe Hawaiian <laughs> shirts to blend in with the crowds. <laughs> okay, well, that's on the way. We're also going to answer your questions for Dr. Debbie and for Joey Volani, the dog father, toll free at one 866 405 Uh, By the way, you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. I just found out that Robert Semro, he's going to be talking about the five questions cats have for him. Apparently, I don't know when, but cats are asking him questions and how he's answered. Okay. And why is he doing this? Apparently, tomorrow is National Answer Your Cat Day. (laughs) <laughs> Which is her? I yeah exactly yeah. that was my <laughs> SWAT smack. Uh, so that's on the way, Lori. What are you working on for this hour? Well, um, there is one lawmaker who is in trouble for what he did with a rabbit on an airplane. Oh. But get your <laughs> Uh-oh. Mind, I'm really. It's 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 not bad, but he is in trouble. We'll tell you about it. Politicians uh, and rabbits, and rabbits and, on a plane. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to picture that. <laughs> Toll free one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. Let's go to Marie. Hi, Marie. Hello. How are you? Where are you calling from today? I'm calling from West Terre Haute, Indiana. Oh, listening on WIBQ, I imagine. Uh-huh. Thank you so much. I've got the whole team here for you. What's going on with your animals? Okay, um, I have. A, it's a tomcat. He's a stray, and I've had him here. Oh, we've been here four years, and I'd say he's just a little older than four years, but maybe maybe six years. Okay. And um, he has uh, on the right on the right ear, right beti- beside the skull and the ear. There's a a sore there, the size about the size of a dime, mm-hmm. and it'll get a top on it, and then he'll scratch it and tear it back off, and. Um, before the weather got real, real cold, he was shaking his head at, like he might have had um, ear mites. Okay. But, um, but my daughter told me that if he did hear, have ear mites, you can't do nothing about them in the winter time. So I was just going to see what the doctor had to say about it. Well, um, my first question for you is, is this a kitty that you can handle, that you, you touch, or is he a true feral that he's just kind of running around? Um, no, I can, it, while he's eating, I can go up and like maybe rub, uh, some medicine on that spot with cotton ball. Okay. Um, no, he's not real, real bad. Okay. And is he a kind of kitty you can get in a carrier and get to the veterinary office? Uh, we have had him to the, to the, um, the spot neuter place. Uh, okay. One time he's been in a carrier. Uh-huh. Okay. Because it's so going to depend a little. It would be li- real easy to do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the reason I ask is because it just determines, like, what we can do. Now, for a kitty that's not accustomed to a lot of handling, there's a lot of different options that I would have for a pet when we're thinking, okay, maybe ear mites or some kind of skin infection, at least it sounds like we've got going on. So um, mm-hmm. some of the things that I do here in my office, if I have a, a cat that we don't have a lot of hands-on ability, um, so if we have a, a skin wound on the face, I might want to use an antibiotic. Um, there is actually an antibiotic you can give by an injection. Um, it's a cephalosporin antibiotic, and it lasts for a couple weeks. And that's kind of a convenient way that we can treat some of these um, 
uh, types of skin infections or even bladder infections when we don't want to medicate a cat regularly. So that would be one thing. If he's the kind of kitty that we can, A, get to the vet, and B, your veterinarian can give an injection to, that would be a great thing to try. And it doesn't require you putting medicine on top of that area at all and catching him. The second thing is if we're worried that he could have some kind of skin mites, um, yeah, you can use ointments and creams and catch him and put him in his ears, but, you know, I would be tending to think of a couple different therapies we could consider. One is a topical, um, actually a flea tick medicine, uh, selamectin, or also known as revolution, and um, we can apply that to the skin, and you can do that. That's something your veterinarian can give you or they can do in the clinic setting, and it's just a little vial you put on the skin, and usually I repeat it again in a couple weeks, about two weeks. Um, but that can be very helpful for treating mites, um, as well as some other types of parasites as well. Um, and so that, again, you know, that's something that, you know, they can start in the clinic setting, you can repeat at home and see if that helps relieve some of those symptoms. Um, and, you know, obviously, uh-huh. if, if possible, I always like to get some evidence and some skin tests or swabs from the ear to see what we've got going. But if we're just kind of keeping it simple and trying to do some good for a kitty that you may not be used to the most handling, um, that, that would be my approach to things. Uh-huh. What did you say the name of that was? Um, the topical for the mites would be known as a revolution. There is also, okay. um, there's a variety of different ear medicines that we can put in that contain ivermectin, and those may be in gels or so forth, but those usually have to be repeated um, by, you know, instilling them in the ear and then repeating them again in two weeks. And and that can be a little bit more upsetting for a cat that's not used to a lot of close handling. So that's kind of why the other treatment was what I had in mind for, for your situation. Uh-huh. Is, this a, is this revolution, is it like a, a little uh, salve or something I can just rub on it? It's not going to go on the site. It actually just goes on the skin, and that's geared towards treating uh, mites, like ear mites. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, you don't apply that to the infected or the irritated area. It just goes on the, on a healthy area of skin elsewhere, and uh, that works oh. to kill those mites. Yeah. Like maybe when they put the stuff between the shoulder blade or something? Exactly, yeah. That would be exactly the way we ad- administer that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Now, he, yeah. he does not have, I heard the lady uh, talking about ear mites. And um, he doesn't have nothing coming from his nose, no sneezing. Uh, he's not shaking his head as much as he was before. It got real, real cold. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just that he keeps tearing that top off of that sore, and then mm-hmm. it's not going to heal if he keeps tearing that off, you know. Yeah. And, uh, well, like I, I said, I'm probably I, doing that from scratching, huh? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would certainly, those would be my first steps. And if that didn't seem to work, then, you know, then I think you go looking for some of the, the less obvious things that can cause that. There are types of allergies in cats where they can have uh, sores, they can be itchy, they can be allergic to food, and that can translate to skin sores as well. So um, mm-hmm. but that, that takes a lot more yeah. working up. So <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's a big, heavy cat. I mean, uh, there's five of them that, that lives here. And they've all been, they're all boys, they've all been fixed, Aww. and uh, thank goodness they they don't spray and they don't fight one another now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but this yellow one, he just had trouble with that spot on his ear, and so I thought I'd talk to you about it, and I appreciate the information. All right, well, my pleasure, and best wishes with him and the whole crew of those boy kitties for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Marie, listening in Indiana. You're an Indiana gal, aren't you? I sure am. I come from Hammond, Indiana, in the northwest part of the state. Is so, that uh, anywhere near Terre Haute? Kind of, sort of. It's kind of near Chicago, Gary, up in that area. Um, but I went to school at Purdue, so kind of more mid-state. Uh, so I've seen all parts of the, of the state. It's a beautiful place. Very, very cold right now, and I am so happy I practice in Las Vegas now. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Toll-free 1-866-405-8405 to talk to Dr. Debbie or Joey Volani right now. Uh, hey, Walter, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Very good. Where are you calling from today? Uh, Barbersville, West Virginia. Well, welcome. Thank you. How can we help you? Okay, well, I have a cat who makes it very difficult for me to apply the Advantage 2 to the back of her uh, neck. She okay. shifts her head all around. And I was wondering if there's some some gadget or some way I can teach her to <laughs> stop doing that and allow me to part her hair. It's a long-haired cat, too. <laughs> Okay, so she's kind of doing the exorcist when you're trying to do this. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, well, um, the easiest thing is to have a uh, assistant, someone to help you out. I have found that when we need to do a topical or even for oral medications with cats, um, you can do what we call make a kitty burrito. Uh-huh. So you kind of wrap the kitty up in a towel. 
Okay. And it helps to keep the legs somewhat immobile. You can kind of hide the, the head at the opening and just get exposure to the neck area. For some cats, that can actually calm them because they don't feel like they're vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so that so that's one route to do it. For if we're just applying a you know a flea tick topical, a lot of times it, you can just by kind of using a gentle scruffing with your fingers, you'll get exposure and you can create like a little line of where you'll see the skin, and just apply your flea topical in that area, or. For some cats, I like to go l- less stress, <laughs> and you can do this by just letting her sit and do her own thing. Don't kind of manhandle her. Don't make her feel like she's being restrained. And I just start a little bit back further on the body than the area I'm going to go, and I just push with my finger, and I'm going to move forward up towards the head with just light pressure. And by doing that, you'll see you know where the skin meets the hair, and just kind of slowly do that, and you'll have a, a little line where you can apply the topical with very minimal restraint. Um, so I don't know if either of those approaches, and I have my own cat. I used to do this with him. Um, little ladies' hair clips, you know, the kind you put your hair up with the little uh, jaws. Yeah. It, it actually would induce my cat to almost like a kitten-like state where, you know, mama cat grabs them by the scruff of the neck and they relax. So for him, that was actually something that I could do things to him by just putting this very gently, you know, nothing you know, barbaric here, but very gently on the scruff of his neck, and he would relax and just not move. Huh. Um, so it, it really is depending what's your cat's personality, what he or she is going to adapt to the most easily with the least stress. But that, that's a little, what is your cat's personality? What kind of kitty do well, we have? Well, ordinarily, she's very uh, calm most of the time. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I would probably either try the, the least restraint method. Um, you know, if he's pretty chill, then you know, try, try the little uh, uh, hair grabber. <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Hey, thank- All right. Good luck with that. Thanks, okay. Walter. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. We can't tell you why canine caviar is the only alkaline-based dog food, but we can tell you alkaline is proven to minimize the risk of renal failure and pancreatitis, reduce scratching, cellular degeneration, and disease, keeping your furry friend youthful and healthy longer. And those are the reasons we can fit into this short commercial. But by visiting caninecaviar.com, you'll see exactly what we do to make a better food for your dog. Try the one and only alkaline dog food risk-free. Canine Caviar. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. Yeah. It's toll-free, 1-866-405-8405 to reach out to the Dream Team, Dr. Debbie and Joey Volani, and occasionally they have questions for each other. <laughs> I don't know everything. I have questions, too, especially when it comes to grooming. So what's up? So, Joey, I have this question. So my my uh, relative has a little mini poodle, and it's like maybe a seven-pounder. He's male, and um, as the um, the male person in the household has a problem with him looking too uh, feminine or poodle-like, you know? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> So is there a type of like a name of a clip that they can do that still kind of gives them a little hair? Because he's just like skin down to the bone. Do you know what's so funny is this question I probably hear from most poodle owners more than any question. So this isn't this isn't unique at, at all. It's funny how many poodle people, they don't want their dogs to look too poodle-ish or too girlish. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, well, what did you get a poodle for? But um, And you know what? I love the look of, the, of a poodle. But... Um, you know what? Remember this. There's something that we call snap-on combs. And snap-on combs is something that you don't see in a human barber, but you see they use them a lot in grooming salons. And they want to use a number two snap-on comb. And number two, and the groomer will know exactly what I'm talking about. And what that's going to do, it's going to leave about a quarter to a half inch of hair on the dog. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but on a dog that has a coat like a poodle that stands out, it actually it's, it gives the appearance of a nice, fluffy-looking dog. Now, I have a question for you. Do they not like that, you know, that shaved face, that, um, you know, that real pointy muzzle look? 
Um, currently they kind of do like a little mustache on him, so he's not like a totally clean face, no. And he doesn't okay, have the so poof up top. There's a couple of things they could do. They can do a Bichon type head or a panda head. Now that's a rounded head and gives it almost like a stuffed animal look. Or we could do something which is called a sweetheart or a donut mustache. Sweetheart mustache is exactly what it sounds like. It's heart shaped. Donut mustache is exactly what that sounds like, and it's rounded. Any groomer will know exactly what they're talking about. But it's still going to have a little bit of a poodly look. I recommend a panda or a bichon type head. And I'm going to say most people who don't want the poodle look um, end up really liking that trim. Okay. Now, is there something called a cowboy cut, or do they just make some name up for something? <laughs> no, that there actually is a cowboy cut, but that's a true poodle cut. That um, is. Okay. You know, right. in the the guide of poodle grooming, which is the Kellstone Guide, and it's pretty much like the Bible for, for poodle grooming, and um, that will have all your cuts in it, but really, all those cuts for poodles make them look like poodles. The Bichon or the Panda cut will, will make them more like a stuffed animal. If you want to talk to Dr. Debbie or Joey Valani, toll free 1-866-405-8405. Just around the corner, we're going to talk to Maria Goodovich. She's been on before, and she's written a book called Secret Service Dogs. She's gone undercover, and she's telling us all about the dogs that protect the president. The Secret Service. They're Secret Service dogs. They're Secret Dogs. I've never even seen a picture of them, like in you know the newspaper no. or on the news. But or do anything. they show you pictures of all the Secret Service people? No, no it's, it's, it's a, a secret. secret. <laughs> Good boy, Doctor Debbie. But you can pick them out. But geez, you never see a dog. That's so cool to know. Absolutely. So we'll find out more about them in just a few minutes. Also, Robert Semro with five questions cats have asked Robert, and Robert has answered, and he's doing this in celebration of I believe it's Answer Your Cat Day tomorrow. I don't know who made that up. If it was a <laughs> <laughs> Company. Another way to sell cards. <laughs> Hello, Animal Radians. It's Robert Semro, your Pet World Insider, here with this week's Animal Radio List. Five things cats have asked me and my unfiltered answers. All right, so you know how much I love all the pet holidays, and I don't think that there's nearly enough of them. <laughs> well, I've got one for you that proves that I and every grumpy cat lover out there are right. It's National Answer Your Cat's Questions Day. Yes, it's a real celebration. It's upon us, and I thought I would share with you five of the most important or irreverent questions that cats have asked me. And those of you who know me know that cats and I have a unique relationship. Yes, I love cats, and cats love cats. So let's begin with the one that you're all thinking, and a Persian cat once asked me about, is there really a National Answer Your Cat Day? I replied that there absolutely was, to which he replied, That's ridiculous. Every day is Answer Your Cat Day. I also met a Burmese who once asked me if I lived in a tree and had my own scratching post. I told her that I had lots of trees at my house, but no scratching posts. The Burmese told me she knew my type, always with my head in the clouds, chasing the world, but forgetting my priorities. A Sphinx once asked me about my obsession with clothes and my ridiculous haircut. I answered that I wore clothes to stay warm and that my hair was actually short. The Sphinx looked me in the eyes and said, and I quote, Your hair isn't short. Get a haircut, hippie. And the layered look belongs in the 90s. She was right, because we all know Sphinx are very fashionable. Next up was the question that a Bengal asked me about hunting and lasers and if I knew where the catnip was stashed. I told him that I was all for cats with lasers hunting while on the good kind of catnip. We still hang out to this day. Unfortunately, the lasers gave way to glow sticks and electronic dance music. But as we all know, Bengals got moves. And have you ever just sat and stared at a Bengals beautiful coat and all the patterns and colors? I have. And that's why I believe catnip should be legal in all states. Oh, wait. Breaking news, Cat Nation. Catnip is legal and cat lasers are still annoying. Finally, a Savannah cat asked me why I thought it was so cool that they would play in water walk on leashes, and chase balls. I replied, it's so fun, it's entertaining, and it's just like... At that point, the Savannah got real close and said, Go ahead, Rob. I dare you to say it. I decided that I would email my answer that day, as I knew he was begging for me to say, It's like playing with a dog. As if I would actually say that to a cat, in person, while it could... <laughs> Sorry, that's going to have to wait for an upcoming Five Reasons I Go to a Pet Therapist episode. Then again, maybe this was all just a catnip-induced dream sequence, and cats don't actually talk to me. 
Share your favorite cat questions and answers on our Animal Radio Facebook page. All dogs should eat a pH-balanced alkaline diet. An alkaline diet reduces health risks and can also reduce scratching, shedding, and hot spots. So does this mean you need to check your dog's pH balance? No, because canine caviar has created the first and only alkaline dog food that is pH-balanced. It also has the highest metabolized calories. What does this mean? Your dog needs to eat less. Get a healthier dog and save money with Canine Caviar products. Find them at your local pet supply store or online at caninecaviar.com. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. This, I believe, would be one of the jobs of my dreams, and probably yours too. The ASPCA, they have a kitten nursery in New York City in this huge building where staff members and volunteers take care of up to 300 stray and orphan kittens, tiny ones, <laughs> at a time. And they really act like the kitten's surrogate mothers. They feed them tiny bottles of warmed-up formula and even groom them with a, a toothbrush. And they say that takes the place of a mother cat's rough tongue. <laughs> uh, another thing they do that would be fun to do and even cuter to watch is blowing bubbles at the kittens so that they can practice their hunting and pouncing skills. How adorable. Uh, the ASPCA opened that nursery a few years ago. They say it was to fill a need because city-run shelters don't have the facilities to care for kittens, and they end up euthanizing so many of them every year. Kittens come to the nursery as young as one day old and usually through the city shelter system. They're evaluated medically first, and then they spend up to two weeks in quarantine. And then after they are eating on their own, they move to what they call the peewee unit, where their are keepers prepare them for adoption by getting them used to being handled and cared for. And then at eight weeks, the kittens are neutered and spayed and moved to their adoption center. But this nursery is only open during kitten season. And if you're like me, I thought, well, that's just, you know, the springtime. That's a short job. But it's actually April through November. The good news, in a little over two years, that nursery has raised 3,500 kittens, Whoa. while at the city shelter, their kitten euthanasia is down by more than 20%. Awesome. Isn't that great? That is good. Yeah. I, I'd like to work there. That'd be yeah, a that'd place be a to great work. job. Yeah. Well, you know, we've all heard of all kinds of, you know, different government officials spending abuses, but this might be a new one. During an investigation of California Representative Duncan Hunter's campaign expenses, the House Office of Congressional Ethics uncovered that the lawmaker had used $600 in campaign funds to cover airfare expenses for his family's rabbit, their pet. (laughs) But uh, that doesn't really irritate me like some other things would, though, you know. Hunter has uh, reimbursed his campaign to the tune of $49,000, however, after the review said that uh, some of his expenses, a lot of them might be inappropriate, including groceries, fast food, items from a trip that he took to Italy, use of campaign funds, of course, for personal benefit, definitely is illegal. But in his own defense, Hunter has said some of the mischarges or reported spending items were errors and happened because his campaign credit card looks so similar To his personal credit card. Oh, right. (laughs) That can happen. That's, I think that's believable. Yeah. Uh, And if you believe that. You would never know what political party I would belong to, would you? No, I could never tell. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now, I'm wondering, um, was this some bizarre coincidence? This just hit me a few days ago that we said goodbye and rest in peace forever, dear Tillicum the orca who died at SeaWorld in Orlando just a few weeks ago. And then, if you didn't hear about this, it was two days after Tillicum died that the very last ever killer whale or orca show was performed at SeaWorld in San Diego. Uh, The company will now replace its signature theatrical whale shows. Formerly, I believe it started as the Shamu show at its San Diego park with a new presentation focusing on conservation and orca's natural behavior. And they've already announced plans to phase out orca breeding. You've probably heard that and other killer whale entertainment shows at its two other parks. (whistles) Whose bone was that that dropped? 
<laughs> that was my bone. <laughs> I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. Hi, friends. This is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. And let's take a call for groomer, dog father, Joey Volani. We have, which one are we going to, Judy? And who's on line three? We have Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Welcome to the show. Hi. What's on your mind? I have a bearded collie and a full coat, and I was going to one groomer for a long time. And it was, you know, a little far from home, and a new one opened up in town, so I decided to try her. And she told me that my dog was extremely matted, so she charged a certain price. Uh. And then she agreed that if I put it on a schedule, then it would be another price. So I did it for uh, five weeks, and when I came, she said it was even more knotted than the first time. So I, I agreed, and then I booked a three-week appointment, and now she tells me that she won't groom the dog anymore, that it's my responsibility to comb it. And I was wondering who, you know, isn't that what I'm paying a groomer for? Well, <laughs> you know what, that, that's a funny question. And um, when you got a dog like that in full coat, um, it definitely needs work in the home. There's um, nothing that a groomer can do, whether it's um, two weeks out, three weeks out, six weeks out. Um, what you want to do is compare it. Now, I don't know if you have long, short hair, but if you have long hair and you didn't comb your hair um, on a daily basis, what it would look like in a couple of days, and you can have knots and tangles. Multiply that by a hundred because don't forget your dog is running, um, you know, through the furniture, rolling on the ground. It's doing everything that you wouldn't do with your own hair, and it's not. It's it's probably knotting up. Now, do you have a brush that you use now? I mean, do you, do you brush the dog whatsoever at home? No. Not at no, all. I, I I bring it for a service. And you I know what? You, you got to understand I mean, that. How often that's... can I bring it? Can I bring it? I you know, every two weeks is too much. Four, three weeks. But is, you know. But if you're doing if you're doing nothing, nothing at all to your pet. And um, basically, um, you're looking for the groomer to um, get out the knots and tangles all the time. There definitely will be a charge. You're definitely going to have a dog that's not. Now, I don't know the activity level of your dog. Well, he doesn't but the do more anything but the walk dog, around the house. We don't even walk him. And you know I, what? He, but even even that alone, walking on 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 the carpet, the furniture, attracting um static electricity, which is moving the coat. Anytime the coat moves, it it turns, it binds, but the other it groomer, weaves itself the other into, into did it a knot. From her house, and she charged you know a, a a price, and she didn't you know. So basically, this groomer told me to go back to the other groomer. Well, you know what I mean. If the groomer doesn't, just, if doesn't you know, want to do it, if it was, if it was me as the groomer, and I had to deal with a dog that was knotted every single time, honestly, um, I would either charge you, and if 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 the client did not want to pay the fee, I would basically say the same thing. What you definitely want to do to make it easier for you, and it'll probably be a lot less expensive, is go out and get yourself a slicker brush. And a slicker brush is is a brush that has short metal curved pins, and you want to brush your dog. Minimum, minimum three times a week. You know, just take 10 minutes and do it. Run a comb through it, and it's going to save you a lot of heartache and time, especially well, if you what, if you like the current grooming that you're going well, to. Well, that's what she told um, me but, to do. That's what she okay, told and, me but to do. You know what? And that's, that's probably the best advice that she could give you because a dog like that in full coat, there is, there is, there's no magic. There's no magic well, of, of, of knots job. and tangles. She, she comes out beautiful. She does a nice job. Yes. Okay. You know, I would definitely listen to her advice because it's really good advice. And not that the other groomer is, is um, you know, is, is not doing the right thing. Well, but I'll tell you what, a lot of times. Not. 
Well, there, there you go. There you go. You just you, you basically just answered your own question. So yeah. what I would do is, is is I would put a brush and comb through it, you know, um, a few times a week. Go to the groomer that you like, and I think that you'll be much happy, and your dog definitely will be because, you know what, when they go to a grooming salon and they are knotted, even if the groomer takes – the most amount of time and is very gentle. That's it's still that. pulling and tugging on the dog. It's she a little bit painful. She didn't want to do so. it to him. That she she felt bad for the dog, and that I I couldn't have him in this kind of coat if I didn't contribute. She is one hundred and ten percent right, um, and I hope that doesn't make you angry that I'm no, saying that. No, but no, she's no. I just to, She's one hundred and ten percent right, and and Thank I would continue you. to go to that groom because that groom is telling you the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your call today. We appreciate it, Cheryl. 1-866-405-8405 to connect with any one of the Dream Team right now. Hey, this healthy serving of Animal Radio is brought to you by the grain-free Red Barn Naturals canned food for dogs and cats. Always made in the USA with natural, functional ingredients to support your pet's optimal health. Visit them over at redbarninc.com. And thanks, Red Barn, for underwriting Animal Radio. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. People say less is more. At Red Barn, we think less is better. It's what you won't find that sets our natural premium pet food apart. No byproducts, no corn or soy, no fillers. Just the natural ingredients your pets need to live the healthy life they deserve. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Naturals Pet Food. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Red Barn canned food for cats and dogs is grain and gluten free. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. An Australian man was recently caught hiding three geckos. In his socks. Police found the little lizards hidden in the man's socks during a routine search of his car and alerted wildlife authorities. It's believed the man caught the geckos, which were a protected species in the wild, with hopes of selling the popular little lizards on the black market. The alleged smuggler had hidden a marble velvet gecko, an eastern spiny-tailed gecko, and a three-spot knob-tailed gecko. A wildlife officer explained that taking an animal out of the wild affects both the local populations from which they're taken, but also can spread disease to other reptile communities. I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people too. Animal Radio. You're listening to Animal Radio. Find us at AnimalRadio.com. Log on, learn more. I am the family dog, and it's that time of year again. The one where pet parents start looking for Fido-friendly hotels and destinations where Fido is welcome. Make no bones about it. Pets are part of the family, and we like to sniff out new places too, and we hate to be turned away, especially when we're on our best behavior. So we won't be left out in the cold. Be sure to pick up a copy of Fido-friendly magazine to find the best hotels and destinations where Fido is always welcome. Go online to FidoFriendly.com and subscribe today. Hi, this is Jamie Farr, and you're listening to the Animal Radio Network. And remember to stay and neuter your pets. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. It is Animal Radio, celebrating the connection with our pets We'll go back to the phones toll-free at 1-866-405-8405. Over the last year, let's say maybe even more, we've been talking about fear-free and fear-free visits to your veterinarian and what that means exactly for your animals. And today, we're very lucky we have Dr. Catherine Prim. She is actually the very first ever fear-free certified professional who uh, took it on back in its early stages. And we're going to find out how it's working for her. Doctor, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So when you do fear-free practice, what do you do? What does that mean? That means I address the patient's fear at every possible opportunity, from the trip to see me, the entry into my facility, the settling into an exam room, everywhere I can perceive there might be a point at which the pet becomes stressed. Okay, give me some examples of what you do. 
Well, I can give you a very specific case example. Okay. Um, we had a, a client who has a German Shepherd named Bucky, and Bucky is an adult and was an adult when he first started to see me, but we had been talking with his owner about the fear-free strategies, and so she really listened. One day, Bucky was coming in for a routine thing, and she called from her car, and she said, tell Dr. Prim that Bucky's just too afraid. I can't get him in the door. So we came outside to her and talked with her and Bucky and ended up giving Bucky a little bit of an anxiety medication injection. And we were able to complete his entire, everything that he needed that day. And then we reversed that anxiety medication. And he never had any stress. He has no bad memories associated with me or my facility or the visit or anything. And she sent me a, a huge thank you note with pictures of Bucky all over it. So it was really a win for everyone. That is great. You know, there's not a week that goes by. Dr. Debbie gets calls here and somebody says, well, she says you got to go to the vet. They always respond, but my pet hates going to the vet. I can't catch my cat and put it in the carrier. <laughs> yeah. I got to know, what made you the first ever certified professional? Well, I had heard Dr. Marty Becker speak about this idea at meetings and things, and I, I thought there was a lot of buzz and excitement built up around it. So I was waiting for it to go live. I, I kept watching the website because I knew where it was going to be and, and checking in. And as soon as it went live, I signed up, I registered, and I started taking the classes because I thought it would make – the life at my animal hospital, just better for everyone. The things that we dread doing to animals are the same things the animals dread having done to them. And so it's a positive experience for everybody. Of course, we encourage every veterinarian that's listening to consider this and think about it. There's a lot of stuff that the pet owner or pet guardian has to do also. It's not just the veterinarian that needs to be involved in a fear-free practice. That is true, and so we make it a part of every visit to sort of heighten the owner's awareness to these subtle cues that the animals are giving that they are experiencing some fear and anxiety associated with the visit. And many times the client didn't even realize when their dog was just repeatedly yawning or maybe panting uh, or wagging their tail and acting really excited that, that that's not necessarily what it seems it might be an anxiety response. How long were the classes for you? Um, well, it, it worked out to be about eight hours of continuing education to get your initial certification. And did you have to do this in person or was this online? It was online. So any veterinarian listening right now who wants to implement Fear Free into their practice can do this online? Absolutely. The web address is fearfreepets.com. I salute you, Dr. Prim, for doing the Fear Free certification. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. The vets get a bad rap a lot of the time, don't they? You know, sometimes. I mean, the overwhelming majority of um, veterinarians are great, caring people. And we're in this field because we love animals. So, it, you know, occasionally you'll get a bad apple in any profession. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that you'll find the majority of veterinarians, um, they want to do right by the animals. And, and uh, Fear Free is a movement. So it is um, different than what I learned when I went through vet school. Um, some of that um, I incorporate in my practice because I want to. Some of that is because the, the newer generation of veterinarians are coming out trained that way. And that's oh, going to wow. be better for everyone. Everyone. Dallin Cable, hope you're doing well. And now for your listening pleasure, a baby and a husky imitating each other. You know, a big consideration for most folks when they go out to get a new dog are the kids. So I'm going to tell you which breeds experts say are the best with kids. And number five, the durable bulldog. He's got a sweet disposition and he tires out real easily. And number four, a breed that seems to be disappearing. You don't see very many anymore, maybe because they're so energetic and they need so much exercise. The Irish Setter, one of my personal favorites. These guys are fun-loving comedians. They're really sweet dogs. But again, they need tons of exercise. The top three coming up after the Husky and the Baby go out at imitation each other again. Reminds me of that movie Ted with Mark Wahlberg. At number three on the list of best dogs to get when you have kids, the Poodle. They're loyal, tolerant, and they shed very little. So they're a really good dog to get if your child might have allergies. Again, though, despite what Joey Villani says, research shows that dogs can be embarrassed. So please don't make your Poodle look like Lady Gaga. We're counting down the top breeds that are great with kids. At number two on the list, the Labrador Retriever. These dogs are loyal, protective, and they love to play. They also come in three colors, white, 
white, black, and brown. And the number one best dog to get if you have kids, according to the experts, the Golden Retriever. Golden Retrievers are very loyal and patient dogs. You know how little kids are, and Goldens will put up with a lot. But it's still very important to remember, no matter what kind of dog you have, and no matter how sweet and loving he is, never leave your dog alone with your child. Your dog might not mean to hurt your child, but because he's so much bigger, it could easily happen. Thank you, baby and husky. This is Animal Radio. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. Well, thank you, big guy. We're going to go to the phones in just a second. Toll free at 1-866-405-8405 for Dr. Debbie or Joey Villani. This hour, we're going to find out all about the Secret Service dogs, the dogs that are protecting the president and the candidates and everybody that works with the Secret Service, which I believe is uh, uh, there's a lot of people that they, the Secret Service has to protect. Hmm. So we'll find out about that okay. in just a few minutes. Lori, what are you working on for this hour? Well, we always like to tell you about those studies that tell you about the benefits of animals and, and pets. Uh-huh. And now, if this is just phenomenal to me. I, th- I think it's terrific news. If you know anyone, or uh, maybe a family member has a mental illness, we will tell you why experts are saying that a pet should be one of the mainline treatments for that person coming up. Mm. What if your pet has a mental illness? Do you get a pet for your pet? You get a human for your mm. pet. You get a human for your pet. Yes. Okay. An emotionally stable human. <laughs> you can find there aren't many of those. No, there really That's aren't. We have animals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go to the phones for your calls right now. Hi, Judy. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Where are you calling from today? I'm in Leslie, Arkansas. Leslie, Arkansas. Okay. How can we help you? I've got a great Dane puppy. And I get a lot of conflicting information on how to feed them. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I wondered if you could help me. Okay, yeah. Are you just, in general, what kind of feeding guidelines because he's a Great Dane? Because, because well, she is Sadie, and um, because she's a oh, Great she, Dane, sorry. I've had people tell me that some people say you should supplement calcium, some people say you shouldn't, some people say you want to be very careful how much protein you give them because you don't want them to overgrow themselves yes. and, and give them bone problems like hip dysplasia. Yeah, some some basic general guidelines I can give. Uh, actually, any large breed dog owner, especially when they're puppies, we do recommend um, large breed diets. And the idea with that is that it allows a more gradual growth, and we don't have real rapid growth bursts. And that can help minimize some of those developmental problems like hip dysplasia, some of the um, other growth uh, disorders with elbows and so forth. So yeah, I. I do recommend that. Um, now, as far as Great Danes, always kind of throw a little extra fun in the mix because, you know, they are a breed we're a little extra cautious about with some um, uh, things diet related. Um, so they're definitely because of their risk of some of the GI problems, if you're familiar with uh, the condition bloat. Yes, well, just barely. I mean, my sister told me a couple days ago about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, bloat is basically a condition in dogs. It can happen in any breed dog, but we see it more in large breed, uh, especially deep-chested breeds where the stomach is kind of filled up, gassy. It flips on itself and becomes a very urgent emer- emergency problem where they can't vomit and they can go into shock, and it's, it's very fatal if not treated surgically. So because of that risk with Great Danes, they can get about 40% of Great Danes can get this problem, so it is a huge t- concern. Um, some food-related things, I'd say. Um, used to be old thought is we wanted to elevate their food bowls. And that's not really the case. They find that um, that can actually increase the risk of bloat in dogs. So we don't oh. want to really use those elevated uh, tiers for the large breeds. Um, and I like to make sure we keep a good, healthy protein level, but we don't necessarily want to give excessive amounts to a, a Great Dane. Um, as far as the fat content in food, they have done some research and found that Great Danes or uh, large breed dogs with bloat, if they have high fat in their food, they are more prone to having this problem. So that's even yet another thing. <laughs> but I would definitely make sure with uh, Great Danes or any large breed, we do uh, frequent meals. So we don't want to have one big meal in the day. 
um, mm-hmm. spread it out over a couple meals for the day. And that's good for digestive health as well as to prevent things like bloat. Those are some basic things. Do you feed him uh, dry food or a canned food? Dry food. Okay. And that's kind of another interesting thing. In most cases, we say dry food is the best thing to go for. Um, but with dogs, uh, large breeds with the bloat potential, um, we actually do recommend to add canned food into the mix of things because an all-kibble diet actually increases the risk of bloat in these large breed dogs. So that might be another thing for you to kind of consider and um, it's sometimes hard to feed like all canned food to a dog that's 150 pounds, so not too many people do that realistically. <laughs> but um, it would be a, a good reason to um, incorporate that into her diet. Okay. Um, what about the surgery that they do for bloat? Yes, the uh, prophylactic gastropexy. And it's basically a preventative surgery where we go in and we uh, surgically tack or kind of tether the stomach um, to the body wall. Um, That is recommended. And uh, ideally, we try to do that at the time of spaying or neutering or at some other time, you know, even preventatively it can be done. Um, But they have found that that has been in in at-risk breeds. It's been very valuable. Um, So uh, breeds like... um, um, the Great Dane, Weimaraners, uh, Standard Poodles, and Rottweilers particularly will be good candidates to do this preventative surgery. So, yeah, I would be a fan of that for her. And what is a good age to have them spayed or neutered? I can't remember which is which. Most times we'll, we'll do that at about six months of age, um, depending on your veterinarian. And as far as some of them want them a little bit older because they feel that uh, everything in the abdomen is uh, for the stomach surgery is um, a little bit more mature. But generally six months should be good. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Hey, Doc, okay. i got a quick question, Doc. Sure. Uh, isn't part of the bloat thing when they eat too fast, don't you want to try to eat, have them eat slower? Mm-hmm, absolutely. That is a, definitely one of the other risk factors, eating fast. It used to be thought that, you know, if they eat and they go run and exercise, that increased their risk. But some of the studies actually show that, you know, it's not so much the activity after, but dogs that eat fast, uh, older dogs, uh, bloat is more common, deep-chested, actually, believe it or not, nervous dogs. So if your dog has kind of an anxiety, nervous potential, those pets have a little bit higher risk of developing bloat than the calm, laid-back, couch-potato-type dog. (laughs) Interesting stuff, huh? Yeah. Yeah. 1-866-405-8405. Let's uh, go to James, who has a call for Joey. Hey, James, where are you calling from? Well, right now, I'm in uh, Lake Park, Georgia. Lake Park, Georgia. Yes, sir. I'm a truck driver, and I'm calling for a little bit of Joey's advice here on account of, I have this little bug that loves to ride around with me, but sometimes we stay out on the road for very extended periods of time, and, you know, giving them a proper bath is not very feasible, so I'm wanting to know what I could do for him, you know, what products or what procedures I Joey might recommend to keep him clean and, you know, healthy while he's out on the road with me. So let, let me ask you a couple of questions here. What's your main objective is just to clean the dog? Is the dog getting stinky? Is it shedding? Because that's going to determine really, you know, what direction I go in. Yeah, well, I brush them every day. Um, but we're out sometimes for two months at a time, and it gets a bit oily and stuff, you know. And, and okay. we're walking around in grass that, you know, I don't know what's in there. I just want to keep I mean, I got front line and all that for him as far as fixing fleas and all that. Uh, I, I t- you know, he just gets dirty. There's a lot of products out there and wipes that you can go to the store and, and get um, a lot of some um, spray, um, dry shampoos, and, and, you know, a lot of things out there on the shelves that you can go out and buy. But if you want a real quick fix, and this works unbelievable, and it's good that you're brushing and combing the dog now because you, you, you're removing the dead coat. So if you're used to doing that, you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy yourself a 69-cent box of baking soda. Now, baking soda, you're going to sprinkle that in. In the coat. Now it's going to do two things. It's going to number one remove the oil because it's going to absorb. So you're going to sprinkle it on. You're going to let it sit. 
I don't know, just a couple of minutes, and then you're going to brush it through. Not only is it going to re- absorb the dirt and the oil, it's going to also neutralize any odors, any smells, or anything like that. Um, and it's going to, when, when you brush it, it's going to fall off the dog after it absorbs everything and fall to the ground. So the best thing to do is, is I wouldn't do this while you're in your truck. I would actually do this outside of the truck when you stop, um, sprinkle the dog with it, brush it through. It's going to be real safe. It's really good for the coat. Um, um, the dog is going to smell good, and a r- really good thing and trick with with um, dogs that have folds in their face, and and some some pugs do, some pugs don't, depending on you know how flat the face is. If you use that and you put that in the folds, it'll dry out any type of moisture that's in there, and the baking soda portion of itself will um, actually remove any facial odor. It works really good. It's a good thing. It's nice and cheap, and you know what? I think that you'll be really satisfied until you know. Listen, nothing's ever going to replace a good old soap and water bath, but this is something that you can stretch out with a short hair dog. Um, you could stretch it out quite some time. I think be real happy with it, too. Well, that's fascinating because that's one thing I was really worried about was, like, the fold in his face. I mean, I get into a cutis every now and again, and I've been using, like, wet ones and stuff, but that's a very good tip. I'm and, really thankful. You know, and you can continue to use the, the the wet ones, but um, the baking soda. You know, after after you wipe it out with the wet ones, go in with the baking soda. And I'm tell you what, you're gonna notice that there's no odor from the face, and if there's any irritation, any redness, nine times out of ten, that's gonna go away as well. Mm. I use that on my mother-in-law. She has a real wrinkly face. How? She's kind of a stinky face too. So, and I got that tip from you last week. I appreciate that. One eight six six four zero five eight four zero five to connect with the Dream Team right now. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. The Movie Man Six Second DVD Review starts now. A big waste of big talent. The comedy keeping up with the Joneses might be one of the worst of the year. I'm out. Just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappylandAudio.com. That's HappylandAudio.com. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. Guests at a Missouri restaurant complained when one of the patrons was monkeying around. Well, mostly because he's an actual monkey. Debbie Rose of Springfield says Richard, her monkey, gives her the emotional support she needs to overcome an anxiety disorder. Without Richard, she wouldn't feel comfortable enough to go out in public, shop for groceries, or eat in a restaurant. The local health department determined that Richard wasn't a service animal because he wasn't trained to do a specific task. But a representative from the Justice Department in Washington said a case could be made for the emotional support that Richard the monkey gives his owner. Until they sort it out, sounds like Debbie and Richard may have to hit the drive through I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people too. Animal Radio. You're listening to Animal Radio. Find us at AnimalRadio.com. Log on, learn more. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio, toll free, 1-866-405-8405. Dr. Debbie, you see a lot of strange animals. You see the cats, you see the dogs, you probably see gerbils and hamsters. But yeah, you, yeah, you, you got it. You practice in Vegas, so you probably see some out of the ordinary animals, huh? I do. I mean, we see some reptiles, birds, um, things like hedgehogs. Hedgehogs. So, you know, all sorts of little, little oddities, but mostly pets, you know. I mean, I don't work on horses, um, anything quite large like that. So you've never worked on a camel? I know what? A camel? Yes, a camel, you know, with um, the two humps. Sometimes no, one. Yeah. No, have not. Not yet. Um, not many pet camels that I know of in Vegas. I'm sure there probably are some. Yeah. We do have sand in some areas. Well, now in uh, Iran, if you're a veterinarian, you have to be uh, proficient with working with camels. And in uh-huh. Iran, there has been a car camel collision increase. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of collisions between cars and camels huh. happening in okay. Iran. So the wow. uh, the government has now said that they're going to create outerwear license plates 
for all of the camels. The camels have to have license plates. Camels will have to have license plates. How People think I'm messing with them now. This is true. <laughs> this is absolutely true. Yeah, I really did. Yes. It's right here. It's in the news. It is in the news and in a reliable news story. So they can be ID'd, I guess, in case of a if crash. There's, if there's an accident. So, uh-huh. Yes. So what do they do? Are they going to find the camel if they like make a wrong turn or if they're into a lot of you know collisions? Is, is it going to be like, what are they going to do? Are they going to euthanize a camel for not being a good driver? No, they're going to go after the camel's owner or the camel's guardian if it happens to be. This way they can ID the they camel. They can ID the camel and ID the owner and oh. then find fault with the owner. So okay. there you go. Wow. License plates for the camels. You heard it here first on <laughs> Animal Radio. I hope they put it on the front end and not the back end. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. So uh, this hour, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to find out about the Secret Service dogs. We're going to do a quick check of the news coming up next with Lori Brooks. What are you working on for this hour, Miss Brooks? I'm going to tell you why. Why I am so not happy or feeling the love for Justin Bieber today, but why I may be falling in love with Jaden Smith. Oh, isn't that uh, uh, wink, uh, wink. The, uh, Will Smith? Will Smith's yeah. kid? Yes, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Okay, and do you a little you, young for me, but yeah. Mm. Do you usually <laughs> do you usually find uh, no problem with Justin Bieber? You, um, you said you're you feeling know, not... I put him in the artist category, and, you know, I think if he sings well, then that's his job. Okay. But but there's you know, some, we're going to look at something else. That he's making a lot of people upset. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. Go for Animal her. lovers. Okay. Again? Yeah. 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 So your Justin Bieber report just a few minutes away right here on Animal <laughs> Radio. We have Mary D. on the phone. Hi, Mary D. How are you? Well, I have an eight-and-a-half-year-old female Doberman, and I take her in for her dental exams and cleanings every year but between her exams her teeth pardon me i said very good we're (laughs) saluting you um yeah but her teeth gets that plaque build up and gets really ugly looking between the cleanings and i give her only dry food and crunchy treats hoping that you know to keep them cleaned and I was just wondering if little dental scalers, like uh, dental tools to scrape the teeth, is a good thing to do between cleanings. No, no. I love the topic of dental care, so I'm glad you called because it's something that there's a lot that pet owners can do. I don't recommend pulling out the dental scalers. Even people who are dental hygienists, it's not necessarily good to pick at the teeth with a sharp instrument and not be able to polish afterwards because it creates little defects in the uh, enamel surface that make plaque build up even more. So um, I would stick to things that we can do safely at home. And um, home brushing by far is the number one thing you can do. Um, so I don't know, Mary D, is that something you can feasibly do for your dog? Um, yeah, she lets me brush them. She likes the taste of the toothpaste, so she thinks that's a treat. And good. I've tried uh, like toys with a dent bone and the greenies and nyla bone mm-hmm. type things that are supposed to help clean are they marketing things i mean those, those dent bones are they do they really work well, you know, there, there actually are some good products out there, and there's a veterinary dental oral health uh, council. Uh, I'm sure I'm putting too many words in there, but we get it. there's actually a society that looks at the products to see if they are very useful or mm. not. And there are some that are, and greenies, believe it or not, are actually advocated oh. for um, showing that they actually can help good. prevent tartar buildup. So there's other things. I mean, there's uh, other foods out there, and they are also endorsed by the health, um, the oral health council. Um, um, prescription foods like uh, Hills TD, Purina has a dental health diet. There's actually quite a few things like that that actually do have some sound evidence. And, you know, these things will help a little bit, um, but brushing by far will give you the best um, success because it not only helps to prevent that tartar buildup, but it also helps to keep the gums healthy. And that's where some of these other things may not have as much benefit as brushing. Um, so I try to brush as often as you can uh, daily if you're if you're up with the, that frequency, if not even three times a a week is useful. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, some of those treats are actually very useful. Now, um, the other things, there's some water additives that have been um, also uh, shown to be helpful in preventing tartar mm-hmm. and plaque buildup. Um, Aquadent and uh, there's some other brands out there that can be valuable. So that would be something. And in my office, we even use something that's an oral sealant called Oravet. 
And if your dog's good about letting you brush their teeth, um, then you might even consider the sealant because you can also do that oh, if cool. you're brushing your pet's teeth. So there's a lot of things like that. And, you know, you can do all of those things, Mary D, and you're still going to have this constant buildup of plaque. Um, and it is the same battle that we face when we go to the dentist every six months. So um, find what works for you and for your, your baby girl there. And, um, and you can battle that plaque. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. The Movie Man 6-Second DVD Review starts now. It's trying to be Gone Girl on the train, and it doesn't completely derail, so I'm in, but just the caboose. Just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappylandAudio.com. That's HappylandAudio.com. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. There is an ever-growing body of evidence that reinforces the many health benefits of animals. And I sure hope with all my heart that you are listening every time we share these stories with you. Hopefully you've heard about all the physical health benefits of having pets that we shared. And now we have more great news from this new study published in a psychiatry journal. Now, this study sought to explore the role pets had in support and self-management and the personal networks of those suffering from long-term serious mental illness. Uh, mental illness like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Now, their research concludes that, this is a quote, pets should be considered a main treatment modality rather than a marginal source of support in the management of long-term mental health problems. So that is pretty cool. This study, in it, the participants were asked to rate the importance of those people and things that were close to the patients. Uh, things like, you know, their family members, their pets, friends, uh, activities, healthcare team members, and so on. In the end, 60% identified their pet as the most important part of their life, and they felt their pet played a wide range of positive roles, like helping them to manage the stigma associated with their mental health by providing acceptance without the judgment. Pets were also considered particularly useful during these times of mental health crises and relapses. In this way, they said that pets provided a really unique form of validation through their unconditional, unjudgmental support, which the patients said they were often not receiving from other family members or in other social relationships. The positive impact of pets ranged from things like offering, you know, daily routines, consistency in their life, uh, being an immediate calming influence, and one that also distracted the patient when things went wrong, when they were hearing voices or having unpleasant symptoms of their illness. The researchers were pretty balanced in all aspects concerning the patient and the pet, too, writing that it was also a priority that a plan of care for the animal be included in the patient's treatment plan should that patient ever require hospitalization in the future. So we're going to share this link for this study on our website, should there be someone in your family with a mental illness that might benefit from a pet or someone you want to share it with. Um, this is pretty sad. According to TMZ, it's okay, a gossip celebrity site, but they're <laughs> probably more factual than the rest. Pop star Justin Bieber has dumped yet another pet. Oh. This time, yeah, his seven-month-old Chow Chow puppy, it was named Todd. Very, what a cute, you know how cute Chow puppies are. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently... He dumped the dog on one of his dancers, uh, C.J. Salvador, who took the pup to the vet only to find out that Todd needed surgery after being diagnosed with severe hip dysplasia. Now, within 22 hours, this dancer got online, raised more than $8,500 for this surgery, thanks largely to three separate donations totaling $6,000 from a Jaden Smith. So... I was wondering, hmm, Jada I bet Smith. that is the young actor son of Will and Jada Pinkett Smith. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he, spe he spelled it differently. But isn't that pretty cool to know that we have a, 
a little animal activist care person out there. It is. It it sort of balances out Justin Bieber. Yeah, you need those to balance him out. (laughs) But, you know, uh, that wasn't the first pet that Bieber has dumped. Um, He handed uh, his pet hamster at one point to a fan just after a Christmas concert in Georgia a few years ago. And then it was, I think, about a year after that, that a monkey that had been given to him as a gift was left behind in Germany. And the monkey was actually confiscated by customs officers there because uh, Bieber couldn't produce the required papers that he needed to take him home, you know, to transport him. Uh I know. Like, TMZ was not happy with Justin Bieber either. Is anybody? Finally, uh, no. Well, I don't know. If well, zit faced 11 year old, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a man in Wisconsin now. And uh, his outdoor security camera captured some mysterious video footage that has reignited rumors about a Milwaukee lion. Isaiah Hare is this guy's name. He received an alert on his phone early this month, alerting him to movement detected by the security camera in his backyard, leading him to check the footage, you know, see what's up. So the video revealed what investigators say appears to be a very large cat strolling across his yard. But Mr. Hare told a TV news crew, I've seen house cats on my camera before, and they weren't that long or that tall. The footage has reignited those rumors. You might remember this. that stemmed from a July of 2015 video that showed what looks like a mountain lion uh, wandering Milwaukee's Brewers Hill neighborhood. Police said the state's Department of Natural Resources investigated both sightings, but no animal was ever located or positively identified. And despite what Mr. Hare said, officials say they suspect the animal in the latest video was a common house cat. I don't know. I mean, man. you don't I want it to be a mountain lion. Have Go you ahead. seen the video and the pictures? It, to me, looks like a mountain lion. Does it it's, really? It's spooky. It does. Could, it yeah. could be like a, ma- a big Maine coon or something like that. <laughs> well, it's it's short-haired, and it's kind of that kind of tan color. It's all even hair-coated. It does not look fuzzy. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you, you have to check it out for yourself. I'm going to go do I'm that. I'm thinking, yeah. Dr. Debbie, we should get you a plane ticket and send you to uh, <laughs> the Wisconsin <laughs> Department of Natural Resources. No, we have Mountain Lion out here. But, no, I think they've actually looked at the paw prints, too, and determined that it has kind of the more characteristic big cat appearance where the nails don't touch. So, like, a house oh. cat um, or a coyote might, you know, you can see the nail marks when they, they uh, have their paw print. So I think there's some... Some evidence that it could be a big cat. Okay. I'm going to try and get a hold of Mr. Hare and play him the clip of what you just said, okay? Because that's going to make him feel a whole lot better. (laughs) I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. Hi, friends. This is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. It gives me great honor to present the dog father, Joey Volani, exclusively on Animal Radio. How are you doing? You know what? It's been a crazy, crazy couple of weeks of me, and then just trying to get in here today it was nuts. But you know what? I'm here, and now I'm happy, and things are good. So you know what? It went from bad to good. Yeah. Yeah. Relax here. Have a donut. 
<laughs> no, I can't have donuts anymore because I've become allergic to wheat. So what are you trying to hurt me now? <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Wow. Yes, I've become allergic to wheat, so I, I can't have wheat products anymore. I mean, that happened when I turned 50, so. Well, I think I have some figs go. over here, some dried figs, if you would like. Figs would be, I like dried figs. That's good. That's a good Italian there's a veggie thing, tray so. over there in the green room. Oh, I didn't see that. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> veggie, yeah, I'd rather have the figs. Anyway, so listen, I got a great, great letter from um from this woman, and she has a colleague, and I'm gonna actually um hold on, here's the, let me get the let me get it out. Okay, and what she asks is this: she said that she has a colleague regularly groomed. She said she listens to Animal Radio, and what she's has found that over the years of uh, me speaking is that. Sometimes when you trim the coat of the collie or any double-coated dog, what ends up happening is the coat gets thin, and that's what she was saying that she heard me talk about. She says, well, that's been the problem. What they've been doing is they've been cutting the dog down, thinking that it was going to reduce shedding, and then found out that it doesn't reduce the shedding at all. The dog just sheds, you know, um, shorter um, hair that's more impossible to get out of your carpets and furniture and all of that. But what it's done, it's damaged the coat, and she wants to know what she can do to get the coat to turn around. This situation, especially if you have a red dog like a um, Pomeranian or a Chow Chow, because the undercoat is light. But on a dark colored dog, sometimes it just it just looks weird. So what you have to do is is we got to train the coat back. We got to get that natural growth pattern going. And the only way to do that is by what I call natural process. Natural process is this. Shedding dogs shed when you cut them down is an unnatural process. So the coat is all messed up and it's wondering what's going on. So what it's going to do, it's going to grow an abundance of undercoat. So I got to bring that top coat back. And the only way to do this, brush and comb, brush and comb, brush and comb. Now, unfortunately, in some situations, you might be too far gone. But usually, if you're diligent and you stay on top of it and you do it every single day and you're going to pull out a ton of undercoat, and the first thing you're going to start noticing is a color change, and the color is going to go from light to dark. And that's why I use the red dog as an example because you, you really start to see the difference. And when you start seeing that dark coat come in, you're making progress. Don't stop. Continue to do it. And usually within the next couple of not weeks, not days, but months, you're going to start reversing the process. And then you're going to have a dog that's going to look great and not going to shed and going to be back to normal. In winter, you can practically hear your skin changing, drying out, flaking, tightening, becoming itchy, irritated, and inflamed. You need the fast relief of Cortisone 10 Intensive Healing Anti-Itch Cream. Unlike regular lotions, Cortisone 10 relieves itch and irritation with 1% hydrocortisone, the strongest non-prescription itch medicine, plus seven healing moisturizers. With Cortisone 10, winter can just sound fun again. Cortisone 10, feel the heal. Use as directed. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio. This is where we celebrate the connection with your pets. We'll go back to the phones. Calls for Dr. Debbie and for Joey Volani. Toll free at 1-866-405-8405. And uh, yesterday... The inauguration of our brand new president. And although this is one of the first presidents in history that doesn't have an animal in the the, the, the White 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 House. House, I know. You should know that there are plenty of dogs involved with his administration and with every presidential administration. Really? Yes, there is. They're Secret Service dogs. I never thought oh, about that's that. Right. Yeah. You know, they don't really talk about them. They try no. to keep them under wraps. But our uh-huh. good friend, we welcome back Maria Gudovich. How are you doing, Maria? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on this morning. So you just wrote a book called The Secret Service Dogs, The Heroes Who Protect the President of the United States. And uh, I was unaware that there were actually dogs that protected I the president. I didn't know that either. Tell us yeah. what, what you found out, what you know. Well, it is the Secret Service, so they, they haven't really gone around telling people about their dogs. And I learned some fascinating uh, – it's just an incredible program. There are actually 
dogs at almost every layer of protection for the president, the vice president, their families, and the pope when he visits. Um, and the, the dogs protect the White House. They protect the White House physically or by sniffing for explosives. They go everywhere the president goes. How many are there? Uh, <clears throat> that is something I cannot disclose. Uh, the Secret Service asked me not to do so for operational security reasons, so I'm sorry I can't give that number, and I didn't give it in the book. But there are quite a few. Well, I know the past presidents have had dogs. How do the Secret Service dogs interact with the president's dogs? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> most are kept away. The goal is not to have interaction because with dogs, you never know what's going to go on. And these are Secret Service dogs. Some are trained just to sniff explosives. Others are trained to protect against anything that could do harm to anyone at the White House. And so you don't want some, some dog you know, strolling out and surprising one of those dogs, although they're in, incredibly well trained. Um, they wouldn't fight back. But there was a, they, they, they talked to each other. The Secret Service and the White House staff talked to each other all the time on the radio saying, hey, uh, the, uh, the first pet, the family pet, is going to be on the south grounds taking a little walk. And so they'll be aware of that and keep their dogs separated. But Barney, President Bush's dog uh, a long time ago, was well, not that long ago, I guess, but he, he was known for escaping from <laughs> his <laughs> from where he was supposed to be. And suddenly a, a Secret Service dog handler would hear him thundering down the halls of the White House and go, uh-oh. Uh, one guy had to pick up his dog. It was an explosive sniffer dog. He had to pick up his dog, a German Shepherd, really quickly. And Barney leapt up. He didn't pick him up quite high enough, and he got the end of his tail. And fortunately, help arrived before anything could, could ensue. Barney also got outside where the um, tactical dogs were a few times and surprised them. But those guys are so strong, they just hoisted their dogs right up on their shoulders until Barney could be taken away. Wow. <laughs> when I visited the White House, they, they had a lot of squirrels there. And I, I know <laughs> ladybugs like, squirrel, squirrel? Uh, yeah. What, what about these dogs? Do they react yeah, to the squirrel? <laughs> Yes, they have the same tendencies. These dogs are high drive. They're very driven by things like prey or a ball. And so they are, they can be very interested in, in squirrels. The dogs they have selected of late seem to be less so for some reason. I, I think that they just start training them so intensely that they don't have time to think about squirrels. But in the old days, and when the program was really getting underway, there, there have been just as many squirrels, I'm sure, but there was this this one dog who was so fixated on squirrels. He he treed one once, and he just he that's all he would care about after that was squirrels. He didn't care about protecting the president. It was all about squirrels in trees, squirrels on the ground. So to get him away from that, this was again a long time ago. They don't do this anymore, but um, they they <laughs> um, they got a stuffed squirrel, a toy stuffed squirrel. Uh, the trainer back then in, in the I think it was the early eighties did, and he opened up the squirrel and put hot sauce inside the squirrel, oh. and then he dragged the squirrel. The dog, the dog went for the squirrel, and when he emerged victorious with the squirrel in his mouth, the hot sauce sort of squirted all over. He shook it out. They gave him water, and and he never went for it again. Ah. But that's the only time they've used something like that. These days, they just they just they have very positive reinforcement. It's it's all about positive training, which is really amazing, the things they can do with, with that kind of training. And so they haven't really had to do um, even hot sauce on these guys. Oh, good. And I assume these are all German Shepherds? No. Um, the uh, Many of the dogs are Belgian Malinois. Those, really? those are the ones, the tactical ones. Do you know what those are? They're, they're, the very, they're kind of like German Shepherds, except they're lighter, more lean, and uh, they just go forever. They are used uh, only as uh, they... I should say the tactical unit, the emergency response team ones, they only use those dogs. And uh, But others, uh, the sniffer dogs can be Belgian Malinois, German Shepherds, and there are some dogs um, who will, uh, if, you're, if you have people going, if you have tourists in our audience today, if they're in Washington, D.C. right now, they can actually see some dogs uh, right there in the crowds in front of the White House, usually on the north side, um, they are going to be something like Labrador Retrievers. There's a Springer Spaniel. They are more, the they, they call them the floppy ear dogs, the friendly dogs, even though a lot of the other dogs are friendly. They just call them friendly because they look affable and friendly because of their floppy ears. And there, there's one dog, <laughs> he's a hilarious guy. His name is Rody, and he's really scruffy. He's a, a terrier border, border collie mix, and he just makes people laugh as he goes by. But the job he does is serious, and he's very serious about his job. That's an incredible story. Thank you so much for telling it to us, Maria. Thank and you. Thanks for visiting with us. We hope to do it again soon.
Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for today. Remember, if you need your fix during the week, visit us over at animalradio.pet or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone, Android, and uh, BlackBerry. And that's great to have that app because if there's a recall, and there was a recall just this week, I believe a Purina food recall. And I got a notice on my phone. You did. You'll get a notification yes. on your phone when there's been a recall that might affect you or your animals. So it's a great reason to have the free Animal Radio app. Have yourself a great one. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next week. This is Animal Radio Network. Network.